I would love to have you share with us what you think most everybody or even everybody should know about principles of strength training, principles of endurance training, and principles of, let's call it hypertrophy power and the other sort of categories of training. What do you think everybody on planet Earth should know about these categories of personal and athletic development? Well, that's a great first question. Holy cow. There's about nine different adaptations you can get from exercise. Um, fat loss is not one of those. It is a byproduct, but that's not really what I'm getting at. We can kind of categorize everything like that. And what we're going to, we can talk about are what are the concepts that you need to hit within each one. And then you could have infinite discussion of the different methodologies, right? And so that, that first thing to hit is the concepts are actually fairly few, but the methods are many, right? People have said that in iterations throughout time. So if you walk from the very beginning, the first one to think about is what we'll just call skill. So this is improving anything from, say, a golf swing to a squatting technique to running. And this is just simply moving mechanically how you want your body to move. I'm just going to globally call that skill. From there, we're going to get into speed. So this is moving as fast as possible. The next one is power. And power is a function of speed, but it's also a function of the next one, which is strength. So if you actually multiply strength by speed, you get power. And the reason I'm making this distinction, by the way, is some of these are very close and I'm going in a specific order on purpose here. For example, power is, like I just said, it's a function of speed and strength. So if you improve speed, you've also likely improved power, but not necessarily, right? Because it could have come from the force direction either. So there's carryover. So like a lot of things that you would do for the development of strength and power, they are somewhat similar, but then there's differences, right? So things that you would do correctly for power would really not develop much strength and vice versa. So we can get into all these details later. Once you get past strength, then the next one kind of down the list is hypertrophy. This is muscle size, right? Growing muscle mass is one way to think about it. After hypertrophy, you get into these categories of the next one is, um, these are all globally endurance-based issues. And the very first one is called muscular endurance. So this is your ability to do how many push-ups can you do in one minute, you know, things like that. Past muscular endurance, you're now into more of an energetic or even cardiovascular fatigue. So you've left the local muscle and you're now into the entire physiological system and its ability to produce and sustain work. And we can get into a bunch of differentiations within endurance, but just to keep it really simple right now, the very first one, think about this as, I call this anaerobic power, right? So this is your ability to produce a lot of work for say 30 seconds to maybe one minute, kind of two minutes like that. The next one down then is more closely aligned to what we'll call your VO2 max. So this is your ability to kind of do the same thing, but more of a time domain of say three to 12 minutes. So this is gonna be a maximum heart rate, but it's gonna be well past just max heart rate. Then after that, we have what I call long duration endurance. So this is your ability to sustain work. The time domain doesn't matter in terms of how fast you're going. It's how long can you sustain work? This is 30 plus minutes of no break like that. So as just a high level overview, those are the, the different things you can target. Um, and again, some of those cross over and some are actually a little bit contrarian to the other ones. So pushing towards one is maybe going to sacrifice something else. So as, a, as an overall start, that's really what we're looking at. Within all of those though, they do have similar concepts in terms of there's a handful of things you have got to do to make all of those things work. And we could talk about as many of those as you want, but one of them is functionally called progressive overload. So wh whichever one you're trying to improve at, if you want to continue to improve, you have to have some method of overload. And as you well know, you've talked about a lot, adaptation physiologically happens as a byproduct of stress. So you have to push a system. So if you continue to do, say, the exact same workout over time, you better not expect much improvement. You can keep maintenance, but you're not going to be adding additional stress. So in general, you have to have some sort of progressive overload, but this could come from adding more weights. This could come from adding more repetitions. It could come from doing it more often in the week. It could come from adding complexity to the movement. So going from say a partial range of motion to a full range of motion or adding other variables. So there's a lot of different ways to progress, but you have to have some sort of movement forward. So if you have this kind of routine where you've built Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday or something, and you just do that infinitely, um, you're not going to get very far. So that's, I guess, the most high-level overview of all the things people can go after. And then we can go from whatever direction you want from there. 
So if we could start with strength and hypertrophy, I know many people want to be stronger. They want to grow larger muscles or at least maintain what they have. Yeah. So what are the progressive overload principles that are most effective over time for strength and hypertrophy? Yeah, okay. So I'll actually go a little step back. With every one of those categories I talked about, you have what we call your modifiable variables. So this is a very short list of all the things you can modify the different variables within your workout that can be modified that will change the outcome. A fancy way of saying, if you do this differently, then you're going to get a different result. Um, so modifiable variables. Um, the very first one of those is called choice. So this is the exercise choice that you select. Now, one of, um, I'm going to go double back here. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of inception. So follow me here as I'm going up a layer to come down a couple layers. I have these fundamental laws of strength and conditioning that, that I'll, they're kind of like a little bit of a joke. But progressive overload is one of those laws. Another one of those laws is your exercises themselves do not determine adaptations. So here's what I mean. If you're like, I want to get stronger, you can't select an exercise. That doesn't determine you getting strong. If you don't do the exercise correctly, and I'm not even referring to the technique, that of course matters. But if you don't execute it in the right fashion, then you're not going to get that adaptation. So if you choose, I want to get stronger, I'm going to do a bench press. Well, if you do the wrong set range, the wrong repetition range, the wrong speed, you won't get strength. You maybe get muscular endurance and very little strength adaptation. So the exercise selection itself is important, but it does not determine the outcome adaptation. So the very first thing that you need to think about if you're like, I want to get stronger or add muscle is not the exercise choice, right? It is the application of the exercise. What are the sets? What are the reps? What are the uh, rest ranges that you're using? That's going to be your primary determinant. Now, some exercises are certainly better for some adaptations. For example, um, a deadlift is probably not a great exercise to do for long duration endurance. Like you could theoretically do 30 straight minutes of deadlifting, but it's probably not our best choice, right? It's probably a pretty good choice for strength development, right? Because you're going to do a low repetition, high set range. Um, you could theoretically do bicep curls for power, but probably not your best choice, right? Single joint isolation movement is, is not the best for developing power. You've ever ever done a bicep curl as fast as you possibly can, like that's not going to go well. So in theory, any exercise can produce any adaptation given the execution is performed properly. So now that we've understood that a little bit, the exercise itself does not de determine the adaptation. Coming within each one of these categories, exercise choice is an important variable because it does lend you to things like what movement pattern you're in. So in, in other words, if, if you want to get stronger, and you're thinking, okay, what exercise do I do? You need to think, think a little bit about what muscle groups do I want to use? And that's going to be leading you towards the exercise choice. For example, I want to use my quads more. Okay, fine. Maybe you're going to choose more of a front squat type of variation, a goblet squat. So the bar, the load is in front of you. If you want to emphasize maybe more of your hamstrings and glutes, you're going to maybe put a barbell on your back or do a different one. So the exercise choice is important to the prescription because it's going to determine a lot of your success. Okay, another kind of simpler way to think about this. If you're a beginner or moderate to intermediate, or maybe you don't have a coach, you probably want to hedge towards an exercise selection that is a little bit easier technically. So you maybe don't want to do a barbell back squat. It's actually a pretty complicated movement. Maybe you want to do a little bit more of a again, a goblet squat, or even use some machines or a split squat, something that's a little bit simpler because you don't have a coach, you're not a professional athlete. The likelihood of success is higher and the risk has now gone lower. So the very first variable within all of these is the exercise choice. The second one is the intensity. And that refers to, in this context, not perceived effort. Like, wow, that was a really intense workout. It is quite literally either a percentage of your one rep at max or a percentage of your maximum heart rate or VO2 max. So for the strength-based things, you want to think about what's the percentage of the maximum weight I could lift one time. And that's that's what we're going to call one rep max. Or it's a percentage of my heart rate, right? So if I tell you to get on a bike and I want you to do intervals and I want you at 75%, I'm typically referring to 75% of your max heart rate or VO2 max or you know something like that. If I tell you to do squats at 75%, that means 75% of the maximum amount of weight you could lift one time or close. The third one is what we call volume. And so this is just how many reps and how many sets are you doing, right? So if you're going to do three sets of 10, that volume would be 30, right? Five sets of five, that volume is 25. It's just a simple equation. How much work are you totally doing? Uh, the next one past that is called rest intervals. So this is the amount of time you're taking in between typically a set. So all of those things um, can be changed as a method of progression. And so maybe you want to go progressing from a single joint exercise like a 
a leg extension on a machine, and you want to progress by moving to a whole body movement like a squat. That in and of itself, you don't have to change the load or the reps or the rest. That is a representation of progressive overload. And it's probably a pretty good place to start because number one, especially for beginners, you want to make sure that the movement pattern is correct. Don't worry about intensity. Don't worry about rep ranges or any of these things. You need to learn to move correctly and you need to give your body some time to develop some tissue tolerance so that you're not getting overtly sore. Um, in general, soreness is a terrible proxy for exercise quality. It's a really bad way to estimate whether it was a good or a bad workout, especially for people in that beginner to middle to moderate. In fact, even the bat for our professional athletes, um, we do not use soreness as a metric of a good workout. It's, it's a really bad idea for a bunch of reasons. On the same token, because stress is required for adaptation, you don't want to leave at the gym and feel like, I don't really do much. Like, <laughs> there has to be there. So if you think about soreness on a scale of one to 10, you probably want to spend most of your time in like the three. You mean post-exercise? Yeah. In between workouts? Totally. And I, I know we'll talk about recovery extensively later, but uh, if one body part or set of body parts is sore, is that an indication that one should stay out of training? I would imagine the answer is no uh, in most cases. Um, and secondarily to that, if a particular muscle is sore, does that mean that muscle is not ready to be trained again? Yeah, the answer to both those is the same, um, which is no, right? Um, you can certainly train a sore muscle. You, you need to, I guess, have a little bit of feel on that, right? So if, if you're sore of like, okay, like, and you're moving around a little bit and you're like, man, this is a little bit sore, you can train. If you're like, I can't sit on the couch without crying because my glutes are so sore, like we, we probably don't need to train again, right? We, Does we, whimpering we, count as crying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in that particular case, I'd say you've actually gone to the place of detriment because now you're going to have to skip a training session and now you're behind. So your actual total volume, say across the month, it's actually going to be lower because you went way too hard in those workouts, had to take too many days off in between. You're going to see that you're going to cover less distance over the course of a month or six months or even a year. So you want to walk a pretty fine line. And for most people, I would say hedge a little bit on the side of less sore than more sore because frequency is very, very important for almost all these adaptations. It training frequency. Which is the last modifiable variable, right? Frequency, which is how many times per week are you are you doing that thing? So those are um, kind of our, our global things that we can play with. So when I'm trying to manipulate and get strength versus hypertrophy, or you know what, I want like a little bit of both, all those variables are the things that are going through my mind. Which one do I need to move in which direction so that I can get this outcome and not this outcome over here? For example, some folks might want to get stronger, but not put muscle mass on. Some folks are just kind of want both. And that's a lot of the general public. I want to get a little stronger and a little bit more muscle. Great. But there are instances where people for performance reasons or for purely personal preference, like I don't want to get any more muscle. Great. But I want to get stronger. Awesome. If you manipulate those variables correctly, you can get exactly that. Very little development of muscle size and a lot of development and strength. And this is why we continue to break world records in sports like powerlifting and weightlifting that have weight classes. So there's a top number that we can hit in terms of body size but yet we continue to get stronger and faster. So this is very possible if you understand how to manipulate all those variables. Click the link in our bio to get instant and free access to our Hypertrophy Highlights Fireside Chat, which is Dan and I discussing really personal aspects of how we go about programming for muscle hypertrophy. In that chat, you're gonna hear Dan and I talk about our own experiences working with clients who are trying to add muscle mass, and especially, you're going to hear us tell some stories that you've never heard us talk about in any podcast ever before. This is not something you're going to want to miss.